Mr. Bellamy, welcome to your first official one-on-one -on -one with Comedy Hype. Ah, uh, nice. I made it. <laughs> You've been more than made it. We made it. <laughs> we, made uh, it. we made it. It's we dope. made it. Thank you very much. Um, man, I just want to, for these stories, I love to just like understand like what makes a person, what makes a career, what do they go against as far as the odds, how do they beat other people people in terms of positions and what about them made them special. So I want to take it all the way back to Newark. You know, were you born and raised there? Yeah. So I was born and raised in Newark, New Jersey, you know, one of the largest, uh, actually the largest city in New Jersey, um, uh, blue collar city, you know what I'm saying? Hardworking people, we you know, uh, the city, we had the riots in the 60s, we had a strong um, Black Panther uh, um, influence in our city as well. We had a huge uh, Muslim um, community in our in Newark. You know what I'm saying. So it was very very black. You know. You know what I mean. And uh, so I grew up in Newark with a lot of uh, you know sort of um, hard times. You know what I'm saying. Blue collar family. We didn't have you know a lot a lot of things. We had love. We had you know discipline and things of that nature. But not having made me want to you know make it happen. <laughs> was it um. Cause I, when I hear about Newark, and I don't know what the reputation is now, but I know that it was like a, a you know, it could get dangerous. It was, yeah. it was tough. It was you, you couldn't be really soft. Nah. Nah, it was not, 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 not in Newark. Newark, Newark is a tough city. You know, it's like it, it, for cats like New York cats would be like Brooklyn or or Bronx. You know what I'm saying? You know, most people know what Brooklyn's like. People know what the Bronx is, but they don't know Jersey stuff. But Newark is, you know, it's a tough city. Good folks, you know good folks too but it's just a tough city you know what I mean um, and coming up in Jersey you had to be tough you know and you know signs of weakness was definitely not you know a situation you wanted to display so you know that attitude was like you know kill or be killed kind of thing was what was good for me because I had to make it like you know I had no outs to me yeah like I never gave myself a plan B it's like it's this or nothing you know what one saying? thing um that's synonymous with your brand you come off very likable mm -hmm. Bill's a he's a nice guy I don't really think people are like oh shit Bill Bellamy's coming right but how did you navigate in that environment were you always that way amongst the sharks amongst um, the gorillas the, you know you know I, I like to feel like my brand is 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 what happiness should be like where I try to make people have a good time and you know I thought that if I can make people laugh no matter what somehow something's going to happen cuz that's my gift you know I always had the gift of laughter even before I became a comic I was always like yo be you wow you crazy man oh my god what made you say that guy so um once I realized that I really love doing comedy I just took the street swag and just blended it with the comedy. So even though I wasn't, you know, like the, you know, sort of like the thug comedian or anything, but I brought the energy of the streets. That's why street cats fuck with me. That's why ladies like me, because it's a combo that makes me Bill Bellamy. It's not, it's not just like, hey, I'm the nice guy. You know what I mean? It's like, it's just the combo, you know, right. and it, it just, it's, it's the right sauce, I guess. In terms of branding that combination. Has anyone ever back in the day or felt like, okay, they can test you? Were there any times where people like tested you and or misread you? I mean, I mean the first, I mean, it's, it's famous because everyone's seen it, but like the first person to ever say anything um, was Martin Lawrence. Like Martin Lawrence was the first person who like on Def Comedy Jam. Okay. He, he introduced me, you know, this pretty motherfucker, right? Because Martin at that time, Martin knew I was the hottest nigga on the East Coast. There's nothing to talk about. It was like not even a question, bro. Not even a question. Like I was so right there. Like everybody knew I was about to pop. Like it was just, I was, it was like a cat with a hot album. As soon as this hit radio, you know what I mean? And so when I came out on Def Comedy Jam, you know, Martin had knew about me, you know what I'm saying? And then me and Martin was cool. It wasn't like it was a bad thing. It was just like, he was just like, oh, this, this nigga here. Y'all gonna love this motherfucker because he's pretty boy kind of thing. But it worked for me. Because that was like your first introduction. Yeah, so he kind of labeled me labeled like a pretty you. boy kind of dude. 
that kind of worked for me. And um, and then and then, but I but I had the funny too. So it wouldn't have worked if I wasn't funny. Before you hit the stage, and he says that because I'm guessing you didn't know he was gonna. Did it throw you off, or were you just in a zone where I'm just I'm prepared for it? Bro, it didn't matter. He could have said ugly motherfucker. I don't know, you know, whatever it was, I was still gonna get mine. Cause you gotta understand, everybody was so funny. I'm watching other cats get standing O's. I'm watching other cats. I'm seeing Bernie go. I'm seeing DL go. I'm seeing Sid go. I'm seeing Chris Rock. Like cats is going to get it, bro. And so at that time. And I always tell people it was like the rucker, you know, the rucker, if you, you don't even come to the rucker unless you can hoop. And you come to the rucker because everybody want to see you and you considered one of the best in the game. So Def Comedy Jam was just like the rucker. It was like everybody was solid. Everybody had skills. Everybody was funny. So you had to shine. How you gonna stand? You got a bunch of great, great, great fighters. You got to have a great bout today. This ain't the day to be off. You know what I'm saying? Speaking of Def Comedy Jam, I feel like you became kind of a, outside of Martin. You were kind of the face for it. And if I can recall, you were the very first comedian. Yes. To do that. Um, Russell put it together. Did he approach you with Bob Sumner? Or how, how did that so, work out? So Def Comedy Jam, um, you know, obviously was a Russell Simmons sort of um, uh, vision for urban comedy. He wanted to bring urban comedy into the mainstream. Cause he used to be in the clubs, you know, Russell would come through and this, that, and the other. And Bob Sumner, who worked at Def Jam at the time, who was managing me and helping me get on in Jersey, Bob had access to every comedian. Like Bob, I don't know how this worked out, but Bob just was like, I never, Bob had pad, like, he had notebooks of comedians. And like, yo, this dude in Chicago, this dude is from, um, um, from um, uh, Gaveston, this dude, like, he had all these. And, you know, we ain't had no social media in the 90s. And so when um, Russell pitched the show to Def Jam, he made Bob Sumner the talent coordinator. It was a perfect fit. And so when Russell had seen me, he was like, you, you like, you're, th- you're incredible, you're charismatic, you know, you, you got a good look, the bitches love you. It's, it's amazing, like, first of all, what I wanna do, I just wanna make this epic. Like, niggas being real niggas. <laughs> like, that's how he pitched the show to me. I was like, where? He was like, it's gonna be HBO, this is so-and-so, she's like the president of talent, and this, that, and the other, we're gonna do this, man. And I ran into Russell at, at Uptown. The next thing I know, I'm on HBO. That's just literally like bang, boom. It was right place, right. Was there. it like, was it life changing in terms of financially, or was it more so of just career wise? It was both, you know, um, because you know what most people don't know about me. I had a job at first, like um, I was on. I had just quit my job, I think, right before I got Def Comedy Jam, because I was working for two years out of college, and. Uh, and so the shift was dope because I, 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 I bet on myself. Like I was, I was like, yo, I want to do, I want to be a comedian. I was like, I give myself three years. That's what I said. I said, I had saved up some money. I had my rent paid for like six months. So I was like, just in case I don't make no money, I got somewhere to live. Like I, I was that kind of dude. I had a nice little, you know, used car at the time. And um, I said, I'm gonna give myself three years to make it. I've never worked again. Like, I ne- <laughs> it's crazy. I was just like, yo, I'm, I'm going all out. I wasn't married. I didn't have no kids, no nothing. I said, I'm just gonna do me. I'm gonna go after my dream. And that was what it was the best decision because I got, I got out of the corporate world. I was in the clubs. I was ripping everywhere. And then people start talking about me. Like, if I wasn't in them clubs, how was I gonna get a buzz, right? So when you're going for your dream, you gotta make a choice and you gotta step into that thing. You can't like have a dream and sit in the same place. You gotta make moves toward it, right? So that momentum got me Def Comedy Jam and then from Def Comedy Jam, to like a slingshot to MTV. It would almost, my career looked like it went bam, boom. That's what, it was like people be like, damn, Bill Bellamy came out to cat it. <laughs> yeah. That's what it looked like anyway. One thing that um, 
when I think about your brand, are you mindful what you represent in terms of the black male image in the space of Hollywood? Are you mindful of being a considered a nice looking black man in the space of Hollywood? Are you mindful of like, I want to make sure I represent? Always. I've always been like that. Like, if you ever go, you go back to all my movies, go to every movie. I never played myself in no movies. I never, I never did nothing crazy. Because I always felt like I had to represent every black man that ever went to a barbershop, every black man that hooped, every black man that worked at a, at a factory, every black, like, like, I always wanted to be the example of what a black man is and, like, the excellence of us, you know what I'm saying? And, and always pay tribute to our our not only not only who we are but like our imprint so i got to be an example of it right so i always wanted to inspire cats to follow their dreams i wanted to show cats that if bill bellamy could do it you can do it without saying it like without you know like being preachy but i always even to this day like if i get a role or somebody you know off me a role I say, can I go in the barbershop? Can I go in the barbershop if I do this? Well, the cat's at the barbershop. And I know it sounds weird, but the barbershop real for black men. If you can't walk in the barbershop, don't do it. Okay. That opens up a huge conversation. <laughs> I got multiple questions to build into this space. My natural thought is, you know, in terms of were there, t were there times where you were approached with certain roles and you had to turn it down? Specifically, men in dresses. I don't. You've never done that before. Mm -hmm. You've been approached by it to do it. I mean, there's a lot of you know things that you know roles that have been offered to me that I was just not going to do, right? And it's just not me, you know. And if I don't feel like excited, or if I, f I always follow my gut, like I close my eyes and like trust my inner intuition. If my intuition is excited and my intuition is like, oh my God, that's the right energy. If I get a weird sense of something in my stomach, then I don't, I, I don't, I don't mess with it. Because I feel like every image is forever when you do a movie. Every image is forever when you do TV. Like, people still go dynamite, Jimmy Walker, right? He might not want to hear it, but he gonna, it's forever etched in people's mind, right? So I'm always conscious of what imprint I'm putting out there. Yeah. I guess when you, in a space of Hollywood, there are people that don't have that certain standard. If you're chasing the money, you'll do anything. Right. That's his bottom line. I mean, they'll right. pay you a billion dollars to be a goofball and do this, that, X, Y, and Z. And some cats be like, yo, I don't mind being goofball, it's fun, you know, or, or, or play any kind of role. But, you know, I, I just like to believe that I always trust my gut and that I've always wanted to be an example of black excellence. So that's a different role. And you got to be patient and you got to still believe in yourself. And, you know, I was like, I always say like sometime to myself, I was like, yo, would, would Denzel do that? Would Don Cheadle do that? Would Jeffrey Wright do that? You know what I'm saying? It's cats that I respect. You know, would Morgan Freeman do that? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And more directly, do you think Hollywood shies away from black men like yourself where they don't push us? Because you mentioned Denzel, but I don't, why only just Denzel is constantly the only representation? Yeah, because, you know, Hollywood is tough, you know. It seems like, you know, it's only one or two cats per year or something like that when there's so many of us that are talented. I mean, there's so many of us are talented. I mean, look at Jamie Foxx. I mean, the boy does everything. Sing, he's a great actor, he's got an Oscar. I mean, like, I'm, I'm, I know Jamie probably be thinking a lot of times, like the same thing, because he's so talented, but he gotta wait and do the right thing. Like, you know, why don't we see Martin Lawrence more? Why don't we see, you know, uh, uh, Will more? Um, I'm more so thinking about the guys that stay kind of in that B movie area. Yeah, but there's ever. a lot of work in that B movie area, right? But like, why don't they get the bigger, bigger movies, right? You know, um, right now Michael B. Jordan, you know, is 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 winning, right? That's good. It's great for the culture. 
But, you know, we, but Chadwick Boseman was winning too. You know what I'm saying? You know, um, but why aren't we seeing more Jeffrey Wright in movies? Like, brothers that's bonkers. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think Don Cheadle is bonkers, bro. Bonk, like, every time you see Don Cheadle, he murder everything. You're like, damn, this boy good. You know, but all the real cats know you got to produce your own stuff. You got to finesse the game. You kind of got to move like chess and you and you and you still stay true to your, who you are. Yeah. A lot of people will be introduced to you at MTV Beach House. Mm -hmm. um, I was reading an article at one time that the first time you knew about MTV, you felt it was probably very white. Mm -hmm. Um, I think Michael Jackson was the only person yeah. you would go and to look at is what you express. Yeah. Did you make it also a mission, not to harp on this um, conversation for too long, but did you also go into that role and make a mission of, I want to represent our people and I want to blacken things up a bit? Yeah. Absolutely. Like, what people don't understand is that timing is everything. Right place, right time. A lot of things are possible, right? So initially when MTV was first created, they it was mostly rock music at that time right so early 90s mtv was still not really playing black music like that michael jackson was the first dude who was deemed mtv friendly and so as michael jackson came that way and knocked the door down that he don't get credit for he knocked the door down opened the door up for me so now they were like, okay, well, we want to kind of be more diverse in our personalities. So we're going to have this kind of guy, this kind of girl, this kind of guy. Well, what kind of guy could represent black people in black culture that wasn't necessarily a rap artist, but was still relatable to the rap community and the pop? So I was the perfect blend. And so my mission was to be the ambassador of the culture. I was like, I am promoting my people to the billionth power. And when you see my book, you will understand why I was so serious about that MTV opportunity because I knew what it was. I knew what it meant to get H-Town video played. I knew what it meant to get Puffy's new artist on and how he was trying to blow up his new label over at Bad Boy, how important it was for Jay-Z to get on, I was important for Destiny's Child to be on TRL with me. It was gonna change their life, B. They, so you, you, you going from an artist that could probably top out at gold, and you go on MTV, and now you can go platinum to diamond. Like, I remember when Usher was like, Usher was probably like 16, 17 years old, he was a kid. They was barely playing his music. Then him and JD came back with that, um. Um, that first, what was it, 1472? Was that the album? Usher was out of here. <laughs> I think it was 1472. Life in 1472. Right? Mm -hmm. That was the album that I had. And Usher was gone. N go just took off. Uh, the Brat, first album to go platinum, female artist went platinum me. Um, TLC. Nine million apps, some crazy number. They was, they were like the largest selling female group ever, bro. Three girls from Atlanta, bro. And that was that was, that was the power of MTV. So if you had a movie, if you had an album dropping, you had to come through. And I was the guy that was sort of like the personality that people trusted. Cause cats knew Bill was gonna be real. You know, you wasn't gonna, they knew I wasn't gonna jam you up and have you asking you some old idiotic stuff or whatever. And, and you I- You made a conscious decision not to do that? Well, I made a conscious, I, was, I, I made a conscious effort to do everything that was benefiting you as the artist. So when you come in, I'm gonna make Biggie look good. Me and Pac gonna laugh. Cause I want cats to see Pac laughing cause they think he just crazy. You know what I'm saying? But he not, he's an intelligent brother that just happened to shoot at people sometimes. So it's interesting, <laughs> which kind of, you know, in terms of you're someone that do, has done interviews. I'm currently interviewing you. Yes. In this profession, some guys may take it personally or they get upset with the question being asked. Has there been moments where things got a little sticky 
based off what your producers maybe wanted from you, based off of what you maybe the moment you want to create, or were you just strong in, I'm not going to try to jam this person up. I'm, I'm like, how did you service us as a trusted source in interviews mm -hmm. at the same time you didn't want people to be mad at you? Well, the thing that I wanted to do and that I did do was think of what the real people would want to know, right? So if I was interviewing Chris Brown and all the stuff that was going on, the way I would have interviewed Chris Brown was, how did you and Rihanna meet? Was it a real love situation? How do you manage being a superstar, being in love with another superstar in the game? Like I could have, I could have got, and he would have, he would have been able to say that. I didn't have to go talk about anything, but and see, that's what people want. They always want that shock. They always want that, you know, that uh, what they call it, clickbait, like that quick little, <gasps> right? But people, just like the only time that something really weird happened to me. And this goes to show you the power of, of being a superstar, like Michael Jackson, right? So when I interviewed Michael Jackson, <laughs> I had about 30 real questions. I was like, everybody want to know, yo, is Tito mad at you because, you know, <laughs> did you and Jermaine ever have a fight? No. But, like, I had real questions, real music questions and stuff like that. And so they looked at my questions, Sony, no, no. No, we're going to do six. And I was like, oh, snap. Dang, that was the first time I ever, you know, had somebody say, like, nah, 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 nah. We're just going to do it. How did it make you feel like you just. Yeah, because that, that made me realize the machine. I seen the machine. Yeah. You said Sony. Sony music. So somebody in a suit or. The suits. Bro, you got to understand, in my lifetime, there's only probably five stars that the label, like they were, they carrying the label. Michael Jackson was carrying the label. Whitney Houston was carrying the label. You know, you just, you gotta go like, oh my God, they, they're doing everything. There's like 35 people here. Michael Jackson came in here right now. It's 35 people, publicists, 10 people. The art director, you're like, damn, then security. That's that's how crazy it was. So when you, you interview Mike, you, is there a thing okay? <laughs> Cats watching your mouth like what you say and whatnot. I was, it was bananas. 97 comes. 97, I think, was another monumental moment for you. Mm -hmm. We would land Love Jones. Mm -hmm. Play Hollywood. Yes. Going into that role, like, what was Hollywood? Like, how did you prepare for that mentally in terms of the well, Okay. Well, Love Jones was a, a, a specific choice for me. So Love Jones was the movie that I wanted to prove that I am a real actor. So I was doing everything funny, 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 happy, good, you know, we love Bill Bellamy to a role where nobody was gonna like me. You knew I, that going I in. knew, I, I, because I knew what I was gonna do to the, I knew what I was gonna do with the character. I already knew who that guy was. I know who, I know who Hollywood is. So. I said, yo, this is gonna be crazy because Cat's gonna be like, whoa, that ain't Bill Bray, yo, what's going on? And what was so good about that was it was a good choice because I was in a movie with my brother Lorenz, Nia Long, and at that time we're all like young actors coming up in the game. Who knew that Love Jones would become a classic, bro? We're, we made it an academy. It's, it was, it's, I have an academy of, award film noir from love it's crazy like thank god i'm in that movie it's solidified in my legacy right so but if you go back and watch the movie you never forget hollywood because hollywood is the guy that everybody got in their crew he a man but he be lightweight hating so <laughs> so i said i know that dude everybody know a hollywood He'd be like yo you just got that new car man damn it's fly he be staying at the wheels like man shit. wait till i get my shit he be because he looking like he want to steal your car man we should steal that shit. why he got that car not me he that guy i would make i would definitely feel like people end up hating hollywood and you really 
you got upset with this guy. How did that affect you going out of that? Moment? I didn't know that people, I didn't know that people believe the roles in movies. Like, I, I thought I did a good job. I was like, yo, man, I had a great, I said, that was a good movie. People hated me. People hated How me. How far did they take it? They thought, but they was just like, yo, you, yeah, you an asshole, yo. <laughs> Like literally, like from here to yo B, man, you was an asshole in that movie, bruh. Damn, that's you? That's how you were that's that's how you really is. I'm like, nah, man, I'm just acting. You know, those were the words that was on the page. Like, dog, dog, you was in this. You was salt in the game. That's how they would say. Chicks was mad at me. Oh my God. So it would have did it affect your dating? You think? Or did you have to kind of like listen? No, I just had to wait for the for the calm down. So then when I came back with How to Be a Player, I was back, thank God. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of How to Be a Player, that was also in 97. Yeah. Um, Drayton Jackson. Yeah. Man, like, again, that was, I think, Def Jam's first movie. Yes, sir. They did. You know, speaking of someone carrying the label, it looked like you were a franchise player. Yes, sir. If anything. Mm -hmm. So going into that, was there, like, pressure to get it done right? Yeah, well, the, the pressure for how to be a player was to make the char character uh, likable because it was going to be sort of like a, a edgy area for women to kind of digest. Guys could get it, but women would be like, oh, my God. So I said to Russell, I said, Russell, the only way this character worked is they got to like him and be on his journey with him. It's got to feel like... a a toy store kind of thing, like a dude in a candy store, whatever. He could, if I would have made that character arrogant, it would have never worked. It would, it would have never worked, because to be like, oh my God, he's, you know, back to the asshole. But if Dre is a young guy that's having fun with these women, he not being, you know, reckless too much, but kind of in activity, but not like malicious or whatever. He just like having a good time. It's like, hey, baby, what's up? You know what I'm saying? How you doing? He's always laughing. So now the women are like, oh, he's so stupid. And the dudes is like, he getting him. <laughs> That's my man. You know what I mean? Especially when I come out the house and the chicks be bad as hell. Yeah. So we made sure we got the right blend on that. I one. think one thing, too, that elevated the movie was your cast. Yes. You had Natalie Zell Reed. Yes. You had Bernie Mac. Bernie Mac as well. You had um, our very own Pierre. Mm -hmm. uh, you had who else? Jermaine was? Hopkins. And AJ Johnson. AJ Johnson. You know, that's a, and, and, and respectfully, they all had their Spots, moments. yeah. I mentioned Pierre. He currently does our news show with us. Oh, that's dope. Uh, Shout do out you to remember Pierre. the first time you guys met? Wow, I can't really tell you the first time we met, but I remember the first time I think I seen him. I seen him in L.A. Um, and uh, at the comedy store, I think I seen him. This is before we end up doing a movie together. I remember I seen him and shit. And uh, he used to always like have a toothpick in his mouth or something back then for whatever reason. And Pierre actually was a pretty boy. Like, that was his thing. Like, you know, that was his whole kind of like style. Like, he looked like he had, he had an R&B single drop in that summer. And, uh, and he was like, to me, I thought he was a West Coast comedian, but he was, he was killing it, though. He was killing it. I, I was like, dang, he, he's dope. And next thing I know, he was like, yo, dog, yo, we doing this movie together, man. Oh, shit, man, this going to be wild. You know, he was like this. He was always fidgety. And I was like, maybe he itching. <laughs> he was always fidgety. <laughs> Um, speaking of Pierre, uh -huh. he has a message for you. All right. Can we play this and give this to Mr. Bellamy, please? Let's play it for him when we get there. Yeah, let me see. Uh, just press play and just uh, take it in. Yeah. Let me turn the volume on. Yo, what's up, Bill, man? First of all, thanks for coming through the comedy hype situation, man, the family. I uh, wish I could have been there, brother, uh, but conflicts are scheduled, man. But I had to make sure I at least said something. You my man, man, you know, I think about this, look at this movie, I got it hanging up right now. You know, we made some history with that movie. To this day, man, people still ask me, man, why don't we do a How to Be a Player 2? Or why don't we do a How to Be a Player tour? Or look, as you see, look at it, I got the, I got the poster rocking, man. That movie really changed my life. And I want to thank you, brother, for hanging in there with me when we did it. I think the chemistry was bomb. I yes. tell us, man, yo, man, y'all chemistry was dope as hell, man. Y'all right. should have went to another level with it, man. Do some other stuff. And I just think, man, 
unfortunately, we didn't, you know, we didn't take it to another level, man, as far as, far as you know, maybe doing a tour. We could have done a tour together. Maybe we could have done a, a, a sitcom together. I think we had a chemistry to do a sitcom. Um, but, you know, we, we went our separate ways, did our own thing, man. But I always had love for you, brother, and I wish we would have came together and did some stuff, man, some more stuff. And, man, that's something I've always wanted to tell you, all right? So, Bill, keep doing your thing, man, and I will uh, see you on the road, brother. Love you, man. This is my dude. Thanks. Hey, what's so funny? You just made me remember that was a real smack in the movie. Mm, what you mean? So, at least Neil smacked the shit out of Pierre. Right, right. That was a real smack, bro. That was not a stunt double. And he got smacked four times. It was the one from here. <laughs> he was like, damn! Dude, go, go you back. You was, was on set? Yeah, yeah, she smacked the shit out of Pierre for real. We was like, but we kept rolling, but it was funny as so we asked Pierre, like, what was something he wanted to always express to you? Right. I, I don't know. I guess he said uh, you guys had worked maybe three years ago mm -hmm. um, and did a gig. Hearing that, like, what is your reaction to see, like, his, you know, his thought process about y'all could have probably done some more things? And why do you think y'all why we found each other? Well, no, well, first and foremost, you know, everybody in that movie, man, you know, I want to thank them, you know, and my heart and soul goes out to Natalie DeSalle, who we lost most recently, and Bernie Mac. Bernie and I were best friends. Um, Bernie had to be in my movie, because I had just, I had to have Bernie in my movie, because we had did Who's, Who's the Man together. And Bernie, I knew Bernie, I could give Bernie anything, he was gonna make it funny, right? So I knew that. Pierre, uh, AJ Johnson, all those guys. What happened for me was I just blew up. Like, I mean, I just started going off. Like, it was just crazy that the movies, TV show deals, duh, duh, the other, I didn't have any idea that my career would do that. You know what I'm saying? So there was a lot of things that I, when I look back, that I wished I could have did more of, but my career just rolled out on me Is like that. Is that like more like trying to, I guess, strategic navigate? Because it feels like you were a talent in what the industry just... Yeah, they just, they opened the doors to me um, and I, I got opportunities to, you know, uh, being more things, different types of movies, different types of shows. And so I, I was able to, you know, grow my brand. And, um, you know, I'm working on, a, you know, the, the sequel, though. I got something for you. We got something for you. Um, we got something. We, we know, we understand we lost Bernie Mac. Mm -hmm. um, Natalie Del Reed was lost last year. Yes. How did you find out about this? Man, um, I forgot who our mutual friend is. But someone called me and said, yo, we lost Natalie. I was like, you're kidding me. Oh, because what happened was two weeks prior, she had filmed something. I wish I could remember who it was that I talked to on the phone. Okay. And she had just filmed something two weeks prior to that. And so it was just like an abrupt, like, oh my God, like she, she just came through, you know? So that was one of the things. And then with Bernie Mac, um, you know, Bernie, Bernie's situation was really hard because Bernie was rolling. And, you know, I knew when, before Bernie got on, I remembered our conversation with Bernie. was like, man, I got to tell you something, man. They're going to have to let me on TV, man. I can't. I'm too motherfucking funny, right? And he was. And he got on and he started making movies in the Ocean's Eleven, and then he got sick. And then it just, it was just like he went all the way up into his health you know, just started failing, and I was just like, oh man. I didn't know how bad it was. Bernie never really um, let us know, kind of. Um, and so no one knew it was as tough as it was because his breathing was just being compromised really, really bad. And then at near the end, he got pneumonia, and then it was just like, damn, man. We, you know, and he's still, to me, one of the funniest guys I've ever seen live in my life. Speaking of Bernie and being the funniest, there was a conversation between Seinfeld and Eddie Murphy. Have you seen that one? Mm -mm. I think uh, Eddie was lightly didn't think. Do you think Bernie should be on the Mount Rushmore? Is that is that what do you think Bernie is on that space? Ooh. See, the what the thing about Mount Rushmore is it's only four slots, so now you squeeze it. 
Bernie Bernie wouldn't make the first team All American if we were only going four spots. Because you got to think about realistically the Mount Rushmore comedy Eddie on there. You got to have, I mean, Cosby. You got to have like George Carlin. Oh. And if you're going to go white, you might have to have Steve Martin up there. You didn't mention Pryor. Oh, my bad, my bad. I forgot, no, I forgot, that, I forgot. I I here we go, here we go. Start it over, start it over. <laughs> the Mount Rushmore of, of comedy, the classic, we talking legendary four. If you only got your first four, and they're going to build four more. You're going to do your tour. You're going four. If you're going old tour. school, you got to go Richard Pryor. Mm -hmm. You go Eddie Murphy, Cosby, and George Carlin. I'm going to say George Carlin, or you could flip-flop George Carlin out with, like, Robin Williams. You or you could you could go like um, Steve Martin. So I'm gonna say Steve. One of them. One of them, you got to pick one. They, so they a wild, just, there's a wild card slot. You got to have a wild card okay. slot. Okay. Then then my generation, like after them, if we had another Mount Rushmore, in my generation, it would be Dave. It would be Chris Rock. Bernie. I got one more slot. One more slot right now. Who would get that slot right now? If we had to, it would either have to be between Jamie and Kevin Hart. Because you, you got to figure like, all right, movies, imprint on a game kind of thing. Yeah, and I wish I would see more specials from Jamie. Right, just because he got. But like Kev, funny, yeah. Kev could make it because of his body of work and what he's done in the last. So you you gotta you gotta give him his props. So I would say, if it's the most recent new Mount Rushmore would be Dave, Chris Rock, Kevin Hart, and who was the other one I said? Bernie and Bernie. Like Bernie would have to make it. Like. It's just tight because you only got four slots. It'd be better if you had five or ten. One thing um, um, I think about too is uh, how to be a player, mm. franchise player. Mm. You're, a fr you're the franchise guy of the team. Um, there was an interview, Chris Rock. I mean, Chris. Excuse me. There was an interview with Chris Tucker, mm -hmm. and he expressed how much he made from Friday. Mm -hmm. Did you see a financial impact with how to be a player? Yeah, I mean, they paid me. You know, I wasn't. I didn't get robbed. <laughs> Chris Tucker made to 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 be direct. He made ten thousand dollars from no, Friday. No, no. He should have got way more than that. But um, but it wasn't his movie. It wasn't his movie. He was a special guest in that movie, basically. You know what I'm saying? And but I bet you he got his money and money talks because that was his movie. You see what I mean? Because he because you got to understand that was Ice Cube's movie. Written by Ice Cube mm -hmm. and DJ Pooh. So, you know, they should have paid him way more money than $10,000, obviously. But, um, you know, that's that's the game of, of the movie business. You know, the stars make the most money. Yeah. A few more questions. Thank you again for um, your time. In 1998, Cousin Skeeter would come together. That was uh, another one. I feel, as I'm learning you, you're very strategic or you think about you put thought in when you do things. This is a quote that you had in 98. I hope it becomes tr a tremendous hit. I want, that ev I want that everyone knows who Skeeter is. Everyone wants a Skeeter doll, that they want to get a Skeeter. And then they want to get Skeeter in their hamburger packet. Right. <laughs> so you clearly had a big vision for Cousin yeah, yeah, Skeeter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, why don't you think it became, or maybe it, ha it, it has become iconic, but why don't you think it continued? Because I think it only lasted a few years. Yeah, it was like three years. Um, Cousin Skeeter, which was interesting, was people, when I was doing Cousin Skeeter, I couldn't feel the impact of Cousin Skeeter because I didn't have kids. So I didn't know how big it was for a 10 year old, nine year old kid to watch Cousin Skeeter, right? So I didn't know that people, they didn't know my name. That wasn't my audience. I did that for a younger audience. So my demo was 19 and up. I did something for 
10 year old to 15 year old kids. So now I got a new audience that's learning me a different way. They didn't even associate the voice with me. People found out I was cousin Skeeter later. They was like, I ain't even, dog, oh, you Skeeter. So Nickelodeon blew up and at that time Nickelodeon was on the rise. And so as Nickelodeon blew up, remember they started doing an award shows and all that stuff. Then Skeeter started getting big and big. And then afterwards when it, when um when it, they played it again, like they did another cycle of it, the older kids started realizing that Bill Bellamy is cousin Skeeter. They put it together. It was weird. Wow. Yeah, because I, I I I think I was probably part of that group and didn't realize that you was cousin Skeeter. Yeah. 1999. I want to say any uh, given Sunday would come mm -hmm. out. Another one of those roles that was not a normal Bill Bellamy thing, I, I believe, right? right? right. Um, going into that, like, where did you, where were you at in your career to make you, did you really want that role or did it kind of present yeah, itself? Yeah, that was a, Any Given Sunday was one of those movies that I was just like, yeah, this is a huge studio film with a A-list director, Oliver Stone, with an outstanding cast, Jamie Foxx, LL Cool J, Cameron Diaz, James Woods, Matthew Modine. Everybody was on the A game, you know? And um, and I got a chance to play. I, I, my character in that movie was the equivalent to Michael Irvin meets Terrell Owens meets Deion Sanders. Like, the most flamboyant, crazy, unpredictable, on drugs, party cat that the NFL's ever seen. One of my scenes that got cut from the movie was so cold-blooded that Oliver Stone said he didn't have enough time to keep that particular scene in the movie. To this day, I just, you know, wished people could have seen that scene because that was probably one of, on my reel, it's probably one of the most dramatic moments I've ever had on screen because it was just a dude so desperate. The game is leaving him. He doesn't have the drugs and he's too afraid to play without it. It is probably one of the most goosebump, oh my God, moments with um, Matthew Modine that I, um, I put my heart into that role because I was just like, you know, people don't know what it's like to be a football player. People didn't know what it's like, to, even to this day, what they go through with their bodies, what they, the pressure it is to be perfect, the pressure to be fast every time, to not get tired, not to show pain, play with pain. These dudes are like true warriors, bro. Some of them get making big money, most of them ain't. But they all playing like they're making $60 million a play. You know what I mean? So I put my heart and soul in that one. And, uh, and that when I did that film, I felt like, yo, that was a real dope choice because it was different from how to be a player and love Jones, you know, it was a different look. Yeah, do you think we'll ever get to see that scene or somebody may be leaking? I don't know, I think I might post it on my, you just gave me an idea, I think I might post it posting on my social media so people see it, they'd be like, oh my God. Yeah. Um, of course, infamously, we all know about the fight. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised or did you go into it thinking that something might like that between Jamie Foxx and LL nah, would pop off? Man, we, nobody, any given Sunday was a lot of fun. Nobody, you know, thought about anything that would go wrong. I mean, you know, it's the most infamous story and, and, and it's like it's mythical at this point yeah but i told the funny version of it on my instagram and it went what's the not so funny version of it no it's, it's i just made it funny you know it was a unfortunate situation two dudes that conflict over something that wasn't as serious but it really happened and but it worked for the movie in a way because that was the contrast that was in the movie anyway two dudes who didn't really get along two stars two egos two alpha males in the same building and nobody and to be clear what was the reason you, you at least from your perspective that you think that happened it's just 
shit talking, you know, cats popping shit. That's it. They usually get it cracking in the barbershop. <laughs> no one's backing down. Nobody going back down. Cass is laughing. Next thing I know, he pop, 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 pop. That's exactly, it happens every day. Yeah, because uh, I did a report on, on it in terms of uh, right. like the police coming to set. Mm -hmm. Did it get tense, or did you guys go right back into the film? No, because Oliver supposedly said keep. Somebody said keep rolling. Oh, they let it roll. They let the fight roll. He kept half the fight is in the movie. Got you. Okay. Then they go to something else, but the, they used all that pop pop pop. <laughs> um, last few questions, and we're gonna close this thing out. Uh, it seems that you are, as we talked about your journey, you're selective. Mm -hmm. Has it been some times where Bill got it wrong in a role where it's like, oh, mm, I, maybe I should have done that role? Um, Any regrets hmm. of that nature? I mean, if there's any, I didn't get it wrong. I don't think I got anything wrong. I think one of the things that, you know, slowed my momentum down was my commitment to my family. Because, you know, in 2000, Three, when I had my daughter, I was like, nah, man, I can't just miss out on my kids, you know what I'm saying? And then my son was in 2006, and then I was just like, yo, man, i never been a dad before, bro. So a lot of stuff that y'all didn't see me a lot, you know, they was like, yo, Bill fell off, or what happened? I, dude, I was into my family. I got married, you know, I got my kids, they young. And it was so much fun to be a dad. I always wanted to have kids, you know. And once I finally had my kids, you know, even though I love my career, my kids was everything to me, you know what I'm saying? Because I talked to DL and I talked to all, you know, more Chestnut and different cats that had kids. And it was like, yo, you know, you got to make time for your family, B, you know what I'm saying? Because they, they go up fast. It's, that was the cats that was telling me, you know, back then, because they had, even LL, LL, you know, he had kids before me. And he was like, dog, you know what I'm saying? You just gotta make sure you, you know, blend that time, get home, you know what I mean? Make sure your kids know you, make sure you know, you make sure they, they feel your presence in the house, you know what I'm saying? I know you get in the bag. So I always um, thought about that and I was like, I never wanted to regret missing out on my kids. So you ain't see me a lot. You know, I was in, I was in carpool, I was doing all kinds of Did it, um, you said though, people <laughs> thought you fell off, did that? hurt you? How did you process that when someone would say those things or imply that? Like, Well, people, you know, that's what it is. If they don't see you, they think, you know, what happened, you know. They don't know you have other things going on in your life. They don't know that, you know, you may need this time to share the birth of your daughter in that first two, three years, you know, help be around the house. And you got a son who is, you know, a young guy who needs to see his dad, mm. you know. And then my kids want my kids would be like, Daddy, you leaving again? You leaving? It was it was, it was bothering me, you know what I'm saying? I was like, dang, I don't know if this gonna work. Cause now they know days. Daddy, you've been going eight days. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I was like, nah, let me, let me, let me adjust this a little bit. I'm I'm back. I mean my kids are up now, so you know, I feel like I feel like I could just stop Busting your head right now, real quick. I feel like I can come right. get it again. Kind of like when you do a second movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, couple, and this is like last two questions. One thing, and this is a very serious question, is in following your story, it seems like we have lost people mm -hmm. along the way. Um, I mentioned Bernie, Natalie, um, Tommy Ford. Mm -hmm. Tyler Craig, mm -hmm. even close to home, as well as your mother. My you brother. See? And brother? Yeah. Back to back. <laughs> Crazy. Being someone that has kind of experienced death, tragedy, what do you say to people who are trying to overcome it, or how do you continue to smile? Right. All right. So, how do I help you with this one? Okay. So, one of the things that is, you know, really interesting about life as you get older. As well as uh, your barber stylist? Yeah, Devin. Devin. All right, so. Yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm going to repeat it. 
So death, death is really, really a interesting topic, especially when you're dealing with, you know, um, your life with being in the entertainment business, right? Because when I first got in the business, I didn't think celebrities died. I thought they lived forever. Like I was like, this. I was like, I was like yo, when you a star, man, they just got it every day Saturday. That happened, right? But that's not true. And so. Just think of all the stars that we lost, you know, um, Whitney, Michael Jackson, um, Aretha Franklin, um, you know, just, just go, just go in your mind. Uh, all these people that are, that were prolific in their craft, right? You know, people in my business, you know, Bernie Mac, you know, Natalie DeSalle, uh, Tommy Ford, um, uh, who else we lost recently? That's crazy. My cousin, dad, my mom, my, my brother. So all these different things, right? So you go through, death is a, is a reality. We understand. What I chose to do is when I went through my, my pitfalls, when I, especially when I lost my mom and my brother as well, and my cousin, and most recently I lost my other, like it's just been crazy. So I decided that I am going to push harder because then because we obviously on limited time right kind of right we all know that it's an expiration date so i'm on the track of getting busy i'm on the track of you know um giving everything my all so i used it in a positive way where i said okay look well let's get to the if you're going to the gym today let's go get it that's the way i feel about life like let's go get it let's turn up turn it up let's um let's push Harder because what if you don't get tomorrow? So then, if you if to, if, to, if if tomorrow don't come and you went hard today, you live you go out big. You feel me? So that's what I do with it. Some people can't overcome it sometimes, and it and everybody doesn't ever overcome it. Sometimes you're just dealing with it, and I'm probably one of those people. I'm just dealing with it, but I find a way to deal with it where it doesn't collapse you or defeat you. That you 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 carry it like a a badge of honor or like a scar on your body from a war, but you still got to fight. The battle's not over, right? And that's what I do. Fair. Thank you for answering that. Last two. You said that before. I'll be thinking of stuff. <laughs> Motherfucker, I got, I always got two. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> okay. um, so what is uh, your motivation at this point? Well, let me hold that one. One thing about Bill Bellamy, um, I can we can say that you're in your fifties. Mm -hmm. Look great. People might want to know what do you what do you think you're doing right? Is it just genetics? Is it like hey, I'm doing? Are you taking some type of vitamins? What is Bill <laughs> Bellamy for people that want to? The brothers. This is the funny shit. Especially with health. Shit. Especially with black men in health. Let me tell you, everybody goes, why does Bill Bellamy still look the same? <laughs> everybody call me the black vampire. All right. Let me tell you. Let me tell you the secret. This is the easiest secret I can tell you. The gym. Nutrition. Being happy. You do not have to age like everybody else. You do not have to look old. If you take care of your body, I was taking care of my body in my 20s. I was taking care of my body in my 30s. When cats was drinking, 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 and doing all this other crazy, smoking weed and blunts and stuff, I was in the gym. I always had a gym membership my whole life. I always trained like I was an athlete. I always trained like I'm going to the league, even if I ain't. I go put up shots. I play ball. I used to play. I used to play ball four days a week, bro. Full court with dudes 21 years old. They flying, flying. They ain't waiting for me. I'm running. I'm running with them. When I play basketball with cats my age, they can't even keep up with me. I would go and play four games of full court and do two shows at night. So just imagine, I've always been athletic kind of guy, like just running, lifting weights, you know, playing ball. And then I eat good, I eat veggies, you know what I'm saying? And I, I go to bed. <laughs> now, I'm not saying I don't drink, but, I, you know, I drink too, whatever. But I'm saying that, that, that part of it, I think, is probably more or less the real sauce of it all. And then also, um, 
I laugh all the time. Like, think about it. If you laugh and you, and you having a good time, that, that is just release stress off of you. You know, I'm always making people laugh. I make myself laugh. Like, I laugh every day. I, it's not a day that I'm not laughing about something. And I remember a lady told me, she was 97. And I asked her, I said, she looks so nice. And she said, Mr. Bellamy, don't take life too serious and laugh every time you get. And I said, damn, that's so simple, but it's true. That's the sauce. <laughs> and uh, in closing, mm -hmm. when I think about, you know, we talked about what you represent. Um, we understand how the industry uh, operates. Why do you think that, or how do you feel, do you think that the industry knows what to do with you at this current moment? I don't, I'm, you dictate your, you dictate your um, flow, you know what I'm saying? I feel like God preserved me um, for a reason. Think about it, I mean, it's what, 27 years, you know, I've been in the game, and like, why would God preserve me to look like this? Why would God preserve me to, have a time to take care of my children and raise my kids. Why would, and now I'm back on their head, like, and everything is coming out. Like, how does my comedy special come in? My movies are coming back again. It's like crazy. Like, you just got to get through the, there's always highs and lows and ebbs and flow in everybody's life. You know, it doesn't, everybody not going to, movies not going to stay number one every time. You know, I remember when Will Smith was dropping his movies every July and they was making a zillion dollars, but that was a wave. You know, Kevin Hart, same thing, came out killing him, killing him, killing him, and he caught a wave. Like, th that's how the game go. But, okay, can you keep moving? What about when it go down a little bit? And then, can you, do you give up? No, you just come, you, you keep grinding, and, you, you, and you'll come back to where you were. Like a stock market. Right, it's just, a, yeah, it's like, it's like a stock. But you gotta believe in your stock. Like, I believe in Bill Bellamy. Like, I've always believed in myself before you, the cats got on to me. Before the game was like, oh, yo, Bill Bellamy, this. Yo, I, I said to my son, right, this is so funny. So me and my son, we went to All-Star game, and my son, you know, he's, he's 14. So we go to the All-Star game, and the Migos was on fire. This is a couple years ago. And my son was bugging, like the Migos. He was like, Daddy, the Migos is right. Dear, that's way more. He was going crazy. I was like, nigga, calm down. He was like, Daddy, they go Quavo. <laughs> and so I was like, damn. I was like, my son is going crazy. So they, they get a picture with my son and everything was kind of cool and shit. Then my dad, then my son says to me in the car, he said, Daddy, you know they they did a song about you. I said, what? He was like, yeah, quality crow. They say your name, Daddy. You must be famous. <laughs> That was the moment. <laughs> ah! He said, Daddy, you must be famous. The Migos is talking about you. I said, I said, wow, this thing. Take it in perspective. 14-year-old kid. He he too young to know my whole career. He know the Migos though, but the Migos talking about his dad. So he's like, yo, my dad must be somebody. <laughs> shit but but I I take it in such a great way because you know if the Migos like my son said put me in a song I, that's dope as hell that means that I'm a part of the culture and that you know cats see me a certain way like I hear cats say yo I'm on my Bill Bellamy or Nikki had some saying you ain't Bill Bellamy like like Bill Bellamy has become a thing like like a thing like a, a dude I don't know how I don't I never intended it to be like this, but it feels like like being Bill Bellamy is like some cool shit. Like 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 I heard a cat say, yo, I'm on my Bill Bellamy in the club tonight. Like like that's dope. Like I was like, oh shit, I'm when I'm in the club, I'm just Bill. <laughs> but when they in the club, they they the whole name. They I'm on my Bill Bellamy shit. You I can't be stopped. I said, oh shit, that's kind of dope. Yeah. So I'm back. So bitch. you definitely feel like <laughs> You definitely feel like you've gotten your flowers or you at least recognize that? Yeah, man, I'm very grateful, man. You know, I like, you know, play, play around and stuff. But like I said, man, it's just like, but you get your flowers and you got to smell them while you can. But it's also really nice to feel appreciated that you have worked very, very hard and you left an imprint. And it's hard to do that sometimes. People don't do it. 
And some people don't get a 25, 27 year run in the game. Some cats get one album. I have seen that before. Some cats get two movies. Just think about it, right? Think about how many people, the, like in my whole life, it's always seemed like Sam Jackson's been in the movie. How many, how many black guys you know have been in a movie every year of your life? Damn near. Right? So just think about it. For my career is one thing, but look at a guy like Sam Jackson. Look at Denzel Washington's career, and you got to go, wow, these are our legends that are in the game that we have to love and, and, and put them on that pedestal because they put it down for us, and I just want to be one of those guys at the end of the day. That's beautiful, man. Well, Mr. Bellamy, this is your first official one-on-one -on -one with Comedy Hype. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, bro.